blood running down the side of my face. I have never felt that kind of pain before in my life. There's a pressure crushing my lower back. It's everyone's worst nightmare, being eaten alive by a wild animal. In this episode, three remarkable stories from the water's edge. What's it like when you become human prey? nearly killed when an angry gator savagely attacked him in the water hazard on a Florida golf course. I was slammed from the back. My shoulder wasn't attached anymore. The Tampa Palms Golf and Country Club, Florida. The kind of place people come to kick back and enjoy the high life. But its ponds and lakes are also home to creatures that have barely changed since the dinosaurs. Alligators are very common in Florida. And almost any freshwater system can have alligators in it. And that's one of the things that people need to be aware of, is that just because they haven't seen an alligator in an area doesn't mean there isn't one right now. The lake by hole 13 is the territory of this seven-foot alligator. He's always hungry, and he's not too picky. As long as they can catch it and eat it, almost anything is potential prey. And they'll take things as big as deer occasionally. Golfers on this course are always in striking distance of gators, but no one has been attacked yet. Sixty-two-year-old Ike Monreal owns a golf ball retrieval service, diving for lost balls in the lakes here. He normally pairs up with one of his sons, but today, he's working solo. Well, I get as many as 12,000 balls in a single day. And at this time and point, I was being paid eight cents per ball. Ike's been doing this job for the last 15 years and knows how dangerous it can be. I've been nudged not knowing the alligator was in the water. That happens. They'll stay down for 15, 20 minutes. So I've been bumped, nudged, nipped, tail whipped. Almost all of us divers working in the southeastern United States, we have close calls like that. The gator is getting hungrier by the minute. The hot weather triggers its need to kill and feed. Alligator activity is related to temperature. When temperatures get to their highest, uh, alligators are trying to feed uh, on a very regular basis. That's a big concern for Ike. When I approach a lake, I'll look and make sure I'm the only participant in the water he sees a familiar sight. Saw the usual seven, seven and a half foot gator that's there all the time. Ike keeps a close eye on the reptile. Females occasionally do attack humans, but it's not as common as, as males. Males get a lot bigger than females. The coast seems clear, but Ike has yet to notice that another gator is also in the pond. And this one is a gigantic 400-pound male. Generally speaking, the larger the alligator, the greater potential problem with a, uh, an attack on a human. Ike gets on with his job. The limited visibility means he can't see the 10-foot gator coming straight at him. 
a gator determined to protect this new territory. I was just about ready to come out of the water. I had enough air left. Life was good. I was just working away at it. And that's when the gator moves in. All of a sudden, something clicked at the alligator and says, I'm going to go ahead and give this a try. Searing pain shoots through Ike. The horrific force, the slamming effect, the excruciating pain, and I knew it was going to be life or death. Like a sledgehammer, the gator's jaws slam down on his shoulder with 2,000 pounds of pressure. Teeth are very sharp, and they can lacerate and tear, but they don't actually sever like a shark's teeth would do. So uh, an alligator's teeth are mainly meant for holding on. The pain, in all honesty, on a scale of 1 to 10 was an 11. I have never felt that kind of pain before in my life. If the prey item's too big to swallow whole, they'll try and spin off pieces. Ike sees his left shoulder disappear into the gator's jaws. One quick spin, and his arm could be ripped right off. I couldn't bring my arm back to me, so I thought I had already lost my arm. Ike stares right into the eye of a monster. That big, lifeless, dead eye, that look, that eye was right here. I tried getting up and, and going for the bank. Incredibly, he crawls towards shore with the alligator still latched onto his shoulder. Seeing two golfers nearby, he desperately tries to get their attention. They can barely believe what they're seeing. Ike is fighting for his life. I said to myself, you have got to keep your head together here. Over here. Ike can't last much longer, and he knows it. As well as being ripped apart, he could easily drown. Retrieving golf balls in a pond at a country club in Tampa, Florida, Ike Monreal has been attacked by a vicious 400-pound gator. His screams attract terrified golfers desperate to help save him. The shore is only a few more feet away. Rescue is within grasp. And then Ike's gone. He had such size and girth, he just drug me right back down again. An alligator will try and get the, the victim off balance, trying to drag them out to deeper water. And once it's drowned, then they will dine on it at their leisure. struggles. He needs to make sure that he keeps his oxygen supply. Without it, he will die in minutes. I said to myself, you pass out, the regulator falls out of your mouth, and you're going to die here. That's when I, I prayed to God. For Ike, it's now or never. He needs to do something, and fast. I worked my hand around his snout. I was able to turn into him. My shoulder is as far back into his jaw as it can go. Ike jams his thumb in the reptile's eye. The most vulnerable part of an alligator is probably its eyes. Uh, 
everything else is pretty well protected. But the move barely phases the gator. Well, an alligator might expect to have slight pressure to its eye if it, if it grabs a, a large prey eye. Ike could be seconds from dying. He reaches back with everything he's got. That's when I stuck my thumb as far back into his eye and as down as far as I could. The move stuns the gator. But then when he went further in, this was something that was totally unexpected by the alligator. He just went ballistic. The bite got worse, and that's when he tried to roll me. They will uh, grab a hold of an appendage and then spin in the water to try and get that appendage uh, torn off. He's in so much pain, Ike can't keep his thumb in the gator's eye socket. I was thinking that it was, it was, you know, the demise, the end was there. I saw my wife and my three teenage sons looking down at me, and I said, that's not going to work. I said, I'm not going to die out here. I am not going to give up. Whatever it takes, I'm coming out of the water. Luckily, the fight takes them into the shallows. At last, Ike can get a foothold. Now he can stop the gator from rolling him. I was not going to let him kill me. I was not going to let him drown me. And then Ike goes in for another attack. I certainly wasn't going to let him sit there and twist off whatever he had in his mouth. I took my thumb again, took a deep breath, and slammed it in his eye socket. And I swear I got halfway to his brain. Alligators can feel and react to pain. They don't like that. Against all odds, the giant's jaws finally snap open. Ike seizes the opportunity and desperately tries to get out of the water. They learn very fast and probably realize this was not the type of thing that, that it wanted to pursue. Ike scrambles onto the bank before the gator changes his mind and comes back. I looked up at the, the gentleman that was standing on the green. I said, just make sure he doesn't come out of the water after me. I said, I don't think I can handle another bite. The alligator swims away. He went out into the deeper part of the swamp. And at that point, I knew I was safe. Are you all right? Are you okay? He dislocated my shoulder. My shoulder wasn't attached anymore. There were teeth holes an inch across, an inch and a half deep over the shoulder. It's bad, but things could have been far worse. Ike's 17-year-old son had originally been scheduled to work that day. He wouldn't have had the size or the experience. The horrific fact of all of this is I would have lost my son. Ike may never fully regain the use of his arm. He and his sons have not returned to the water since the attack. My sons do not dive anymore. My business is Ike and Sons. My boys I'll not let go in the water anymore. So do I want to get even? You betcha. Four hours after the attack, a state licensed trapper captures an eight foot alligator from the lake, 50 feet from the scene of the crime. If we didn't do that, there is no doubt there would be a lot more attacks because alligators become habituated and if they have a successful attack, they'll come back for another one. Ike doesn't believe the trapper got the one that wanted him as prey. I think she trapped the smaller, the seven and a half, eight footer that was there. And I do not think to this day that it was that smaller gator. In that case, the gator that nearly killed him is still out there.
alligators can prove lethal in the southern U.S. But in Africa and Australia, the biggest threat to humans is their deadlier cousin. Crocodiles kill as many as 200 people every year. The largest and most aggressive is a saltwater crocodile, a powerful reptile that can outlive humans and grow to more than 20 feet in length. Despite the name, their natural habitat is actually freshwater rivers and swamps. What makes them so deadly is their uncanny camouflage. In September 1872, Australian Constable William Davis decided to break police regulations and take a refreshing swim in Darwin Harbour. Davis spotted a log floating some distance out and swam over to it. Suddenly, the log started swimming towards him very quickly. Davis soon realized it was a saltwater crocodile that had left a river and headed into the harbor. But it was too late. As Davis started to swim away, the croc zeroed in, its jaws crashing down on his head. Constable William Davis became the first police fatality in Australia's Northern Territory. More than a hundred years later, amateur diver Jeff Tanswell was also savaged by a saltwater croc. It turned a snorkeling trip into a bloody battle for his life. Yeah. And he was screaming, don't let him eat me, just don't let him eat me. Northern Australia. Protected by law, the saltwater croc population has swelled nearly 5,000% over the last 30 years to as many as 150,000. They are man-eaters, and no stretch of water anywhere is safe. On a tidal river, this 12-footer is looking for its next meal. The diet consists usually of, of fish and crabs, crustaceans, small mammals, that kind of thing. But an 18-foot crocodile can drag down a buffalo if he really wants to. Although he normally hunts in rivers, today he heads out into the open sea. People have seen saltwater crocodiles swimming past oil rigs and, and past boats just in the middle of the ocean. So what's this crocodile doing? It's just swimming from one point to another. On Thursday Island, at the northern tip of Queensland, 37-year-old police sergeant Jeff Tanswell and his wife Jane, also a trained police officer, are hitting the water for a day of fun in the sun. My entire life I've been brought up by the water. So we've always been brought up um, with boats and diving and fishing, and that's just second nature. If we go fishing or we'd just go out and have a look and jump out on a reef. Hi! Hey. Hi! Hi! Today, they plan on doing some spear fishing with their friends Amanda and Dave. They head towards the remote Adolphus Islands, an hour away. We hadn't been there before, so this is going to be another opportunity for us to explore. The ocean around here is dangerous. We're a bit, I guess, aware of the possibility of sharks being in the water. It's something that's uh, always stored in the back of your, your head. Let's just enjoy the ride, but let's be aware. Keep an eye out for a shark. The last thing on Jeff's mind is running into an aggressive saltwater croc. All I knew was that crocodiles uh, inhabit the coastline and they need to go from river to river to river. And they do not go out to sea. And that was what I was brought up with. But he's wrong, dead wrong. A wandering killer croc is also headed to the Adolphus Islands on a collision course with Jeff's party. They pull into a coral reef and scout for any signs of predators. 
we were making sure that there was no sharks or anything in the water that we that was dangerous, but we didn't see any sharks. If there's going to be a shark, he's going to be patrolling the deep water. So I'm not going to go there. I'm going to take the safer option, and I'm going to go in closer to the coast. Amanda and Dave are the first ones in. Because they're entering unfamiliar waters, Jeff asks his wife to stay on board. You have to leave someone on the boat just for safety. If you catch a fish, if it bleeds, you don't want to have fish blood in the water, it could attract sharks. So if they catch a fish or crayfish or something, they just hold it up and I start the boat, go over. Jeff enters deep in an alien world where he is both the hunter and the potential prey. You can see the, all the little uh, colourful fish dancing around in, in amongst all this brightly lit coral. I saw the, the other two diving with us. They started heading out a bit wide. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable diving out to where the coral edge is, where it drops off into the deeper water, because sharks could come and go. Sharks are not the problem. The hungry 12-foot saltwater croc is closing in. I remember a little voice in the back of my head going, there could be other big things out here. The giant croc quietly stalks Jeff and his friends. It's breeding season, and like all crocs, he's more aggressive than usual. Jeff heads up for air. I just thought I'd been hit by a boat. The fear that a predator instills in its prey is it's, it's bottomless. No matter how fast you move, if a crocodile's head is half a meter from you and it strikes, you cannot possibly get away. Jane can't quite make out what's going on. And it all happened within a matter of split seconds. I remember staring at that bit of water going, did I just see what I saw, or is that my imagination? A crocodile clamps down on Jeff's head. And I've become aware of this pressure on my head, this, this, this crushing pressure on my head. The crocodiles have got the strongest jaw muscles of any animal that we know for their size. They've got about 66, sometimes 68 teeth in their jaws. They'll puncture through, fe through flesh, they'll go through shell, and they'll even go into bone. Jeff is dragged down with his head ripped open. He's bleeding heavily and running out of air. He's just gone down with no splash, no screaming, no kicking. Jeff! I had no feeling of, of the water, the temperature, sounds, everything, sight, everything was gone. They've got the power just to shut down your entire system and you don't have a say in it. It was a, a mixture of just horror as well as just total disbelief. You're on a, on a remote tropical coral island. You, you're not looking for a, a crocodile. Jane starts the boat to stop it drifting. She has absolutely no idea that her husband below is being drowned by a giant croc. I could feel by my neck muscles that he's pulling me down to the sea floor by, by my head. That is one of the things that a crocodile will do if it wants to overpower its prey. Most animals can't hold their breath for anything like as long as a crocodile can. Jeff knows he can't stay under for more than a couple of minutes. I'm trying to stop what's going on, but I, I can't. He's, he's just too big, too strong. I remember kicking madly with my fins. You're just in overload. I don't know if it's adrenaline or what. It's all your senses trying to work overtime to save you. And then 
a miracle. I remember seeing the jaws release and the sudden burst of light, and I just shocked the surface. I saw his head come up and him blow the water out of his snorkel. Jeff has no idea where the croc is and when it might bite again. Well, what was going through my head was that his big block head coming back up and, and grabbing my legs. And then just behind his head, I thought I saw something moving. The killer croc surfaces inches away, closing in on his prey. I can feel the warm uh, blood running down the side of my face. He's got the teeth, he's got the scales, he's got, he's got, he's got the claws, he's got everything. You have nothing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just, it was the most unexpected thing. I remember looking at this thing and then the brains kicked into gear going, we've got to try and survive this. The croc slowly circles. It sizes up Jeff from every angle. It could rip him apart at any moment. If the prey is large, then it will produce what's known as the death roll. And then it spins its entire body. And if a crocodile grabs me on the arm and starts to spin, the weak point here is at the elbow or at the shoulder. And that's where it will dislocate. We all know that these things come back to finish you off. Jeff realizes he may only have minutes to live. Police Sergeant Jeff Tanswell has been brutally attacked by a saltwater crocodile in Queensland, Australia. And now his wife, Jane, also a trained officer, is desperate to save him before the croc finishes him off. Straight away, you just think, this is it. Someone's gonna die here. I just had to try and get him out of the water. Jeff's frantic movements are only making matters worse. He needs to get back to the boat before the reptile returns for more. If you splash and splash and splash, the croc can feel that, it can hear it, and it's, it's more likely to attract it back to the place. I stuck my head in the water a couple of times, just trying to see where the hell he went. Next minute, I had the boat beside him, and I was helping him in the boat from the left-hand side of the boat. I don't know how I pulled him out of the water. I think it was just a pure adrenaline. Open your eyes. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I'm right here, OK? Concerned about their friends, Jane swings the boat around to the other side of the bay and finds Amanda and Dave unharmed. But the monster croc is still somewhere below. Everyone may be safely in the boat, but Jeff's wounds are serious. I got a puncture hole in, in my left cheek. I got a laceration on, on my left temple. Uh, the left ear was torn. And I got lacerations on, uh, behind both my ears where the, where the teeth went in and scratches on, on, on my back where his claws went in. It's essential Jeff gets to the hospital as quickly as possible, but they are a good hour away from the coast. He could have a brain injury. He could have some sort of compression on his brain. He could have a stroke. He could also be infected by the croc. Well, his teeth are covered in mud, covered in bacteria. It's a breeding ground for bacteria. If that crocodile then bites you, it drives those bacteria deep into your flesh, and it can cause a much bigger problem than the bite itself. Crocs kill as many as 200 people a year. And right now, Jeff looks like he might join that gruesome club. We got to the hospital and went straight into the emergency room. I had all my wounds scraped and washed out, which was <laughs> quite painful. And then they microsurgery my ear and stitched everything back together. He owes his life to Jane's quick rescue and pure luck. Certainly, if it wanted to kill him, it would have. Jeff knows all too well how close he came to death. And there is nothing as terrifying as realizing that, that this thing is going to come along and eat you. And 
you can't do a thing about it. No further attacks were reported in the Adolphus Island region that summer. Most likely, the saltwater crocodile returned to the coast and headed upriver. The worst saltwater croc attack is said to have happened in World War II during the Battle of Ramri Island in Burma. Surrounded by British troops, a group of Japanese soldiers desperately tried to escape through mangrove swamps infested with saltwater crocs. The next morning, only 20 survivors were found. Nearly 400 may have been devoured by the hungry crocs. The Guinness Book of World Records ranked the attack as the worst animal disaster in history. But crocodiles are by no means the most dangerous animal in the water. That title falls to the hippo, Africa's most deadly creature. Weighing as much as a small pickup truck, hippos kill around 200 people in Africa each year. For millennia, they have been a deadly threat to people living throughout Africa. The mighty Egyptians had the most to fear. Hippos used to live all along the Nile, the lifeblood of their civilization. They were a danger to boats and to people working on the river's edge. The animals were considered so powerful, they were associated with gods. Kings hunted them from royal ships. It was a brutally dangerous sport. In around 3100 BC, Menes, the first king of unified Egypt, is said to have been carried off and killed by a hippopotamus during such a hunt, ending his 62-year reign. More than 5,000 years later, while leading a river safari in Zimbabwe, guide Paul Templer also found out just how brutal a hippo attack could be. I had tusks going through me every which way but loose. There was a lot of blood in the water. You can see it had been quite badly bitten. Oh. The Zambezi, one of the largest rivers in Africa and home to this huge male hippo. The lone bull is particularly aggressive. It probably recently lost a fight with another male and was thrown out of its pod or herd. And now, he's viciously protecting his new territory. Hippos respond the same way we would if someone repeatedly broke into our homes, with extreme aggression. The bachelor bull has attacked seven people in the last few months, defending its turf. And he's more than ready to do it again. Zimbabwe River guide Paul Templer is enjoying a quiet afternoon off when he's unexpectedly asked for a special favor. I was sitting in the pub when uh, the folks came in and said, hey, we need a guide. So now I had a tough choice to make. Do I spend the rest of my day sitting in the pub, or do I go and lead the canoe safari? No, for today. I went and led the canoe safari. It's a decision he would soon regret. Good afternoon, guys. My name's Paul. We have a crew responsible for taking you down this, uh, this amazing river this afternoon. Paul is joined by three other guides, Ben, Evans, and his close friend, Mike McNamara. It's a trip they've done lots of times before. The trip itself is what we call a wine route. It's one of the trips where the, the guests don't actually paddle themselves. And the idea is that they just relax and watch the sun go down. It's a sunset trip, it lasts about an hour and a half. The idea was just to sit back and relax and take in everything that uh, nature had to offer. Paul is on the lookout for the rogue hippo that has attacked seven others over the last few months. He's already had his own nasty run-in with the three-ton monster. 
About six months prior to this, I'd been leading a similar canoe safari, and I'd been attacked by a big, brute of hippo. The hippo had smacked the bottom of Paul's canoe, catapulting him and two passengers into the water. That time, they had escaped unharmed. I knew that that hippo was in the area, and uh, though I couldn't see him, I thought going through the narrow channels would be my safest option. And so far, so good. As they come around the bend, Paul notices a large pod of hippos. They weren't really a concern. They were off to the side, and I could see them, and I felt that I had a pretty good sense of what they were up to. <laughs> they proceed cautiously, making sure they don't startle the hippos. Paul also scans the water for any that are submerged. Occasionally you'll get ears, occasionally you'll get a head, occasionally you'll get the whole body. Um, then there'll be nothing. They'll all disappear underwater. You watch the water, the water's moving differently. If there's a couple of ton hippo moving around beneath it. All seems to be going well. They safely get past the pod into faster moving water. And then... I turned just in time to see Evans flying through the air. Likely it's the same rogue hippo from underwater who surfaced like a giant torpedo and knocked Evans clear out of the boat. Paul watches in horror as the current drags Evans away. Evans went under and then popped up again. Paul paddles full speed towards Evans. I turn my canoe around, so I'm going backwards. So I'm between whatever's there and him. I back in to try to rescue him. Paul reached for him with a paddle, shouting to him to grab the paddle so that he can pull him out. I'm probably four or five feet away from him when I see this, this bow wave cruising in towards me. And it was at that point where the hippo just erupted next to Paul. While he's trying to help his friend, the hippo turns on Paul and attacks. Just all hell broke loose. The hippo just closed its jaws on his upper torso and pulled him off the boat. The hippo tries to swallow Paul whole. They attack the boats not because they recognize I will get to the people in here, but because they recognize it as a foreign object that needs to be removed. I remember this incredible pressure crushing down on my lower back. Hippos are not interested in eating the people that, that get attacked. It's an aggressive reflex of, if I encounter something with my jaw, I will crush it. So the crushing comes from the hydraulic press that is their jaw, um, somewhere on the order of maybe 1,800 pounds. What the canines do is act as hole punchers. They can go through anything. They are strong, they are massive, they are sharp. Paul is kicking and clawing for his life. He needs to get out from the mouth of the beast. Evans also needs urgent help. He's in danger of drowning in the strong currents. There's nothing fellow guide Mike can do. We couldn't get to Evans because the hippo was in the way. Finally, Paul's aggressive struggling pays off. Pushed, pulled. At one point, the monster loosened his grip long enough for me to escape. I just sucked in a lung full of fresh air, and I came face to face with Evans. But Evans doesn't look right at all. I got the sense that, that all was not well. He wasn't going anywhere. I think terror and panic had quite literally overwhelmed him. For Evans, it's too late. He's drowned in the strong current. He literally just rolled his eyes up and he sank and he was dead. And that's when the hippo zeroes in on Paul again. At this point, it was all up to the hippo, and really, there's nothing you can do. This time, the hippo is clamped down on Paul's legs, tearing into skin and bones. The hippo started the attack and was not going to finish the aggressive behavior until the intruders were gone. It happened very quickly. And 
you could see that it was a serious attack, that it was, there was going to be some serious injuries out of this. They don't just try to win, they try to destroy their opponent. One of the clients watching later said that it was like watching a vicious dog, literally just trying to rip apart a rag dog. These huge tusks tearing through my torso as he, as he drove me underwater. So I had tusks going through me every which way but loose. He bit down so hard that I thought for sure he was going to bite me in half. The hippo has speared Paul badly, and now he starts dragging him down to drown him. I remember lying on the bottom of the river and looking up. I remember I could see the different hues of green and yellow and the sunlight shining on the water surface. And I thought to myself, I wonder who can hold their breath the longest. Paul is close to death. Most humans can't go without breathing for much more than a minute, while the hippo can stay under five times longer. Fighting for territory is just second nature to hippos, and fighting to the death is second nature. They don't hold back at all. I watched my blood mingle with the water, and I just wondered which would happen first, if I'd bleed to death or if I'd drown. During a bloody hippo attack in Zimbabwe, Africa, one man has died while another, river guide Paul Templer, has been gored by the creature's teeth and dragged to the river floor. And now, Paul is also drowning. All anyone can do is look on helplessly. The amount of blood that was in the water showed that Paul had been bitten very badly. There's no sign anywhere of Paul. There's no way he could have survived the second attack. I didn't think I'd see him again. And then Paul popped up. But then the hippo spat me out again, giving me another chance to escape. Barely alive, Paul is bleeding badly. Mike guns forward on his kayak to save him. He knows there's not a second to lose. I was just shouting to him to grab the front of the kayak. I managed to grab a hold of the handle on the boat's nose. For a moment, Paul seems safe. But the hippo comes back for more. It tries to chomp down on Paul's dangling legs. Any second, he'll be dragged down again. He was hitting and thrashing, and it, it, was, it was not good. I knew I didn't have much left in me. He can barely hold on. One arm is shredded. Both shoulders are punctured with bites. But astoundingly, the hippo backs off. They're very unlikely to actually come into shallow water to follow an attack. It just, it, it's not what they do. To get to the shallows, Mike has to fight the current. Paul is losing his grip. I was bleeding profusely. I was getting weaker. Paul hangs on. Mike paddles wildly. It's a race against time. I paddled to a point where there was a tuft of grass on a small rock sticking out of the river. The longer it lasted, the more it sapped my energy. Finally, they reached the shallows. I, I don't know how we do it, but Mag, Mac uh, dragged me out of there. The hippo then stopped the attack, moved back, um, and popped up, but not actually following us into the shallower water. Out of his element, the hippo gives up the chase. Oh, I got you, buddy. Just hang in there. Paul is barely alive. Oh, hang on, look at me. Look at me, buddy. Just keep breathing. We got you. He needs medical attention desperately. To make matters worse, the first aid kit and a radio have both washed away. His arm, from what we could see without ripping the sleeve off, had been bitten through the bone two or three times. It was shattered. And a bite mark through the shoulder that you could virtually see daylight through. He was bitten through the foot. You look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Stay with me. Something that's working. Mike and fellow guide Ben try to stop Paul from bleeding to death. And 
started literally putting pressure on, on arteries to try and just stem the bleeding that was still coming. I can feel my lungs full of blood, man. Thinking fast, Mike uses the only thing available, cling wrap from the safari meals. They seal all visible puncture wounds on Paul's chest. Mike and Ben lift Paul into a canoe. When I put him in the boat and sent him off, I thought he was going to die. He definitely didn't look as though with those injuries he could survive. The only way out is right through the killer hippo's territory. What we're seeing is an animal under stress. The first time that someone breaks into your house, maybe you won't fight them off. The second time, maybe you'll fight them off a bit more. By the tenth time, you know, you're armed and ready to go. But as we were pulling out and this angry hippo was still there, I thought for sure he was going to come and finish me off. But the hippo chooses to stay put, and Paul is quickly taken downriver. By chance, along the way, they meet a local medical crew conducting emergency drills. There's a shock trauma team who are just practicing. Just go figure, a couple of minutes away. They take Paul on an eight-hour drive to the hospital, where he learns that his arm is beyond repair. They took off part of this arm. They took it off just above uh, the elbow to start with. Um, I got gas gangrene which meant that my body was rotting from the inside, so they ended up having to chop more of me off. In the end, his arm is amputated. Mike and the River Rap clients are rescued later that night. A search party is sent out for Evans. It was a full two days before we found his body quite a bit further downstream, but it washed out. The rogue hippo is never found. Animal attacks are rare. People are fair game, but we aren't a normal prey item for them. They usually avoid people. But as we increasingly crowd their water world, run-ins are bound to happen. They're animals that are trying to protect their territory. You know, this is their habitat, and this is the area they need to survive. And when these river killers do attack, we become their human prey.